Hello, uh, my name is Robert Love, not the actor, the, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm uh, Luke Lawrence. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, uh, maybe this is a little bit of a different presentation, we're not really highlighting any issues about global education, we're going to introduce a emerging research methodology, which you hope, we hope you might be interested in using in your own research, or in your own classroom as well. <laughs> yes, um, and probably you can uh, apply this to global issues. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 So I guess we'll start by just defining what duoethnography is. It's probably an unfamiliar word to most people. So uh, yeah, so duoethnography, it's, um, as, as Luke said, it's an emerging research methodology. It was first used in 2004 uh, by Norris and Sawyer, who, who invented it. Um, and this is a, a quick definition. Um, so two or more researchers of difference, so two people from different backgrounds or, or you know, different uh, life histories, um, juxtapose their life histories uh, in order to provide multiple understandings of the world. Um, so it's an ethnographic uh, kind of comparative account between two people, between the two researchers. And when they are in, were inventing this research methodology, they come up with a number of uh, tenets of things that should, you should adhere to when you're, trying, when you're carrying out this kind of research. Uh, so the first one is what they call, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, what, do you, what is it? Kure? Kure, But basically it's the idea of your own life history as, uh, as a curriculum. Um, so, but the idea is that yourself and your own lived experiences are, they're not the topic of the research, you're not the topic, but you're just the site. The research is what they focus on. Hmm. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this uh, this juxtaposition of different voices uh, in the text. So you create polyvocal and dialogic texts. Um, it's not one person speaking or one voice speaking in the text. It's two texts in con oh, sorry, two voices in conversation uh, in the text. Uh, another one is the disruption disruption of meta narrative. So it's got this kind of critical approach. So trying to uh, take things that are kind of taken for granted in the literature or taken for granted in popular discourse and to use your own real experiences to kind of puncture these meta-narratives and show that they're not necessarily true. Mm, there's elements of deconstruction in there. Um, another tenet is a focus on difference between the participants. There's no point doing a geoethnography if you've both got exactly the same experiences. Um, so trying to find a partner uh, who is different from you in some way, in the way that you want to focus on. Um, and this also necess uh, necessitates change through dialogue. Uh, so maybe changing your perspective um, by interacting with your partner, you hear their point of view on a topic, maybe you change the way that you think about something. Um, so change is another important tenet of the methods. Uh, another one is audience uh, accessibility. So a lot of uh, academic research is kind of kept inside its own bubble, it uses lots of uh, jargon and language, and one of the main points of geoethnography is that it should be accessible to the lay reader. Yes, uh, in fact, in a, in a geoethnography that I did, we, it was shared quite widely on, uh, on social media, and one person commented, This is brilliant, it's just like a blog post, which wasn't what we were going for. <laughs> um, but, you know, people who don't normally engage with academic research do seem to find this a very accessible way to approach the Not only to read, but to do themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes yeah, yeah. Um, and next, uh, trust between participants. So to do a geoethnography, you have to be very open. Um, you have to be willing to expose a lot of yourself in order for the process to be worthwhile, really. Um, so you have to have uh, a, a partner, a research partner, that you trust, that you trust to share this information with. If you don't, then you'll maybe be <coughs> holding and you won't get the richness of data that you would be able to get otherwise. Um, and finally, well, it's, it's pretty much it's similar to the uh, disruption of meta narratives. Um, it's just putting the extra emphasis that uh, the kind of dominant discourses that we're led to believe uh, are not necessarily the case, and geoethnography can help to expose and uh, deconstruct these ideas through the uh, example of individual experience. Yeah, we'll look at some examples of this later on. Yeah, uh, so basically Norris and Sawyer, they work in the American mainstream education field and it hasn't really transferred over to ELT so much, but here's a quick list of its uses in ELT so far. I mean, as you can see, the earliest example is only two years ago, and that's, that's our friend. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so in ALT, it's very, very new. Mm, yeah. Um, so Heath Rose from uh, from Oxford and his uh, his partner whose name I can't pronounce. I'm sorry. Um, they've uh, they've just published a paper in the RELP journal um, using the method. Uh, these two are both chapters, I think, yeah. in a recent book by Springer uh, and. We are working on a book with multilingual matters, uh, which should be out hopefully next year. It's an edited collection of duoethnographies in English language teaching. And it will be the first collection for the ELT field, we hope. Mm. Unless someone gives in their first. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully uh, not. Yeah, yeah. So that's the use so far. So we're going to take you now through basically just the steps of how to do a duoethnography if you want to do one. Mm. So, first of all, uh, Two researchers who trust each other, um, who have something uh, different between them that, that they can share, decide on a topic that they want to research. So, um, for example, in, in the geoethnography that I did in 2016, um, it was one so called native and one so called non native speaker comparing our experiences. Um, the uh, researchers then engage in multiple recorded discussions. Um, so, this can be done in a few different ways. Uh, Quite often it's done through you know, actual face-to-face -face discussions which are tape recorded. Um, because me and my partner were in a different, con well, different continents actually, um, we used a, an online messaging app which works quite well and we ended up with I think something like 20,000 words of data that uh, the study was based on. And no transcription. No transcription, <laughs> yes. So you do it I did. We did face-to-face -face conversation and uh, we had about 12 hours worth of conversation and uh, there's a lot of transcription, which, yeah. but we didn't transfer all that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, once you've got your data, whether it's recorded discussion, uh, as in a spoken dialogue, or through a messaging service, this is coded by themes, so this is proper data, it's empirical data, and you're looking for themes, as you would in any research project, and looking for similarities and differences. Yeah, so it's, it's a basic uh, process of sort of ethnographic coding that you would do with data. Um, and finally, this is the stage that's perhaps the most, uh, uh, the, the, the stage that people have the most difficulty with. <laughs> sure. um, when you write up the data, generally, not always, but generally, the data is written up as a reconstructed dialogue. So um, it's kind of a fictionalized dialogue, uh, usually a series of dialogues organized by theme. Um, and this is done partly because the people who invented the method uh, work in drama and education, um, but also for audience accessibility. You know, the, uh, the, the method is based on life experience. Um, it's, it's, uh, the data is drawn from dialogue and discussion, and so it's presented as dialogue and discussion. Yeah. yeah. Well, the coding, do you make the categories pre or post? Uh, post. post. Sorry, yeah. 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 Grounded theory approach. Mm. Um, and another, just to add to what Rob was saying here, I mean, if you've ever <coughs> read any research with a transcript in it, have you ever read any conversation analysis, it's virtually impenetrable. It's got little bubbles and dots and brackets and, you know, it's, uh, it's not accessible to the main reader. It's kept in this bubble, which is one of the good things about geodontry. And also, um, you know, life is complicated and the way we talk and the way we interact is is not linear, you know. Me, me and Rob did a different deal than we're going to talk about in a moment, and we did it using a messenger service. And we would stop halfway through a sentence, and oh, I've got to teach, I've got a class, and then maybe the conversation will pick up two days later, and then between that conversation, maybe we emailed each other, and all of this is still data, but putting it into these reconstructed dialogues, it means that we're putting it in this nice, clear, linear way, and also it makes us sound slightly more intelligent than me. Original uh, yeah. conversation. Work. As you can tell, we don't usually speak in full paragraphs. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about our uh, project, and then we're going to go through just the different sections of uh, of the book that's coming out next year, just to give you an idea of the different uses of geography. But first of all, our project. Um, so generally, we, we were we wanted to investigate hidden curricula in ELT. Um, so I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Basically, the idea that um, your, uh, your, your, for example, like teachers, their teacher training, um, what they learn in their teacher training is not explicitly what's taught necessarily, but there are lots of other kind of hidden norms and values that are kind of smuggled in in the background, right? Um, so this is what we wanted to investigate in terms of our uh, teacher training in relation to specifically native speakerism, which is something that we 
we've both researched. Yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with native speakerism. It's just the idea that the native speaker ideal is kind of dominant in the ELT world and it causes discrimination, etc. Uh, so we wanted to look at our training experiences from this point of view. Mm. Yeah. Um, as Luke said earlier, we uh, engaged in dialogue with a messenger service. Um, also, yeah, face to face, yeah, um, emails, emails, yeah, yeah, lots and lots of data from different sources. Um, and uh, we also went back, uh, and so this is something that we've kind of added to the geoethnographic process. We went back and looked through our training materials and kind of did some triangulation with data from like written sources and things like that to improve the validity. We actually found some of our recollections weren't quite right. They were yeah. close, but they weren't quite right. Um, and to an, to an extent, that's not really a problem, right? Because it's what we think happened that influences what, how we act True. now. <laughs> but we wanted to be as, uh, as reliable as we possibly could be. Yeah, we contacted um, old, old colleagues and um, things like that, just to kind of verify our own accounts. Mm. Uh, the data analysis, as, as we've explained, we, we went through and we coded it by theme. Uh, we we kind uh, of took stock every so often, didn't we? Mm -hmm. See what themes have come up and then we focused on the ones that have come up and focused on that more to help to decide the next conversation. Yeah, exactly. So we, we went through kind of stages, I guess, of collection and analysis until we had kind of saturation um, of the themes, the key themes. And we were, at the end, we basically identified three main themes. One of them was the perception uh, and treatment of native or non-native speaker teachers in our, we got from our training, um, how we approach the native and non-native speaker teachers, mm -hmm. how we perceive them differently. Yeah. The second one was a cultural stereotyping of students, um, which I guess we can talk about in the findings, but yeah, the way that students from different nationalities, different backgrounds were presented to us during our training and how that affected the way that we perceived our students in the future. Yeah, and the third one was the kind of the, the cultural chauvinism of the, the global uh, kind of ELT Western pedagogical mindset and how that had kind of penetrated into our souls without realising it. Okay. Uh, but we'll talk about that in the findings. Before we show the findings, we, we mentioned that reconstructed way to do it. Uh, so we're going to show you, first of all, the raw data, our initial conversation, and then we're going to show you the reconstructed version so you can clearly see uh, how it works. So, should we read it? Yep. Sure, okay. So uh, this was the raw data, so I say, okay, uh, we are, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, standards of, um, like, um, native speaker standards yes. in education, basically. So I say, Okay, well in my MA they sometimes give example essays that previous MA students have written. I remember one example by an NNS, a non native speaker, was absolutely riddled, said that a spelling mistake here should be a D. It was quite simple grammar mistakes, but the fever on it just ignored them and gave the paper a far higher score than I think it deserved. In contrast, so again this is a little bit later, uh, my occasional mistakes were jumped on brutally. I think the non native speaker got an easy pass there. Grammar mistakes, you mean? Yes, yeah, not content, just grammar and the overall quality of the writing. That's interesting. I wonder if that's because it was about written academic work rather than classroom practice. I don't know, but they were definitely allowing for the fact that the student was not a native speaker. At the time, this pissed me off a bit, but that was before I knew about native speaker. You know, two friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is what we were talking about, and this is what made it into our final paper. Uh, I won't read it uh, all of it, but uh, basically, I'll read some of it. That's interesting. I had the opposite experience, but I think the outcome was the same, and it pushed me into a similarly conservative native speaker. It's the outlook on my MA course. We were given some lessons of past students' work. They helped us write our own essays. There was one example by a non native speaker. Again, we've got that here, which we ignored in the first one. It was absolutely brutal, and after correcting it, it was quite simple grammar mistakes, but the feedback from the professor largely ignored them, brushing them aside for one or two surface areas from the evidence that I got from going back over my notes and gave the paper a far higher score than I think it deserved. At the same time, I was being lambasted for the tiniest misplaced apostrophe. Again, we've got uh, examples which I didn't have before because I hadn't gone back to look at the materials. Uh, one coming from the tutor towards the grammar mistake, simply said, oh, I've got the evidence here. I saw it as a deeply unfair, uh, pissed off, it's changed into, I saw it as a deeply unfair and clear example of uh, double standards being employed. I didn't understand really at the time, but I think this was the uh, my emphasizing with fellow native speaker teachers from the staff of the So, the previous conversation is put into this much more eloquent version. 
If you want to read the whole paper, it's under a second round of review at the moment, but we'll be happy to send out drafts. Yes, sure, 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 sure. Hopefully published soon. Uh, that's our findings for the paper. Yeah. So the first finding was, um, as, as we mentioned, that our training did influence our, uh, our perceptions of the, the treatment of native and non-native speaker teachers um, and, and learners as well. Uh, and I think you can probably guess uh, what we found <laughs> yeah. Um, the second one, I think, is perhaps, uh, it, for me, this was the most uh, sort of revealing one. Same, same, yeah. Um, so our training had given us these negative cultural stereotypes of students based on native speakers' assumptions. So the idea that, uh, you know, when we, go to, when we went to Japan, our students would all be very passive, and that they'd really respect us as teachers, um, and that we had to be really careful when we corrected them in case we made them lose face, which only happens to Asian students, um, and, and so on. I can't stand that phrase, lose face. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and yet the idea that, this, again, I hadn't realised, this was quite big for me, that in part of this mindset that saw Western pedagogical practices, we both did CELTAs, we both did MAs from the UK, and they, we didn't realise that we, we were thinking, this is the only way, you know, this kind of PPP style, it's, it's the only way, what else is there? And kind of talking to each other, it made us realise that there was another way. Okay, we're going to rush through the next part because we don't have much time, but here are some ways to use geoethnography. Um, so first of all, uh, research in terms of critical issues. Um, so as we said, uh, geoethnography promotes skepticism towards grand narratives. Uh, it gives voice to the marginalised. So in my geoethnography, the, the, the non-native speaker voice was kind of brought out very strongly uh, in, in Luke's um, one that you're working on at the moment. Yeah, this one. one yeah. yeah, there's a focus on... On gender and sexuality and also uh, linguistic status and things like that. Yeah. Um, so there are a few examples here of things that could be tackled using uh, geoethnographic research. Uh, next is using for reflective practice. So um, in uh, a paper a few years ago, and uh, uh, Man and Walsh called, they were kind of critiquing the current state of reflective practice in ELT, and they said that it needs to be rebalanced away from a reliance on written forms, taking more of have spoken collaborative forms of reflection. In some, we argue for a more dialogic, data-led, and collaborative approach to reflective practice. Basically, geoethnography answers all of these. It's dialogue-based, it's collaborative, it's data-led, and it uh, works for reflection on action, so thinking about what you've done in the past. It also reflect, works on reflection for action, so helping you to think about how you can change your behaviour or your uh, practices in the future. And the, first, the last one, this is what we're working on at the moment, yeah, geoethnography is a pedagogical tool. So um, I, I published this article uh, earlier this year um, about using geoethnographic projects with students. Um, so the idea is very, very similar to the research approach. Students engage in multiple in-class discussions. They then go home and listen to their recordings at record home. On yeah. Mm, yeah, record on a smartphone. Yeah, record on a smartphone. Go home, listen to these recordings. Um, summarize what they think are the emerging themes, come back to class, have another discussion based on those themes, and so on. Um, and then they go away, they summarize the main points of the uh, project individually, um, and then they work collaboratively to choose themes and write up um, a, a dialogue in, in the same style as the research approach. Um, a fictional dialogue, but based on the themes and the experiences that they shared during their discussions. So the benefits of this for teaching, uh, basically it practices conversation and discussion based language for the students. It uses all four skills. So they're talking to each other, they're going home, and they're listening, but they're also writing collaboratively. So we get them to use a Google Doc, basically, to write collaboratively, and they're reading each other's work. So all four skills are being used. Yeah, um, and there's a lot of evidence for the benefits of things like um, peer correction during discussions, uh, scaffolding and peer correction during collaborative writing, and of course these are the major two stages in the geoethnographic process. Uh, it's meaningful, and it's motivational subject matter, there's nothing that teenagers like more than talking about themselves. Uh, it's their own lives and the things that they're interested in, they choose the topics, so it's motivational in that way. Yeah, and finally, it improves class dynamics, so, you know, these students, uh, sometimes they know each other already, sometimes they don't, but in any case, um, they're sharing a lot about themselves, they're learning a lot about each other, they're getting to know each other on a kind of a deep and personal level, and, and they're becoming sort of vulnerable with each other. Um, and I, I've found doing this with students that this leads to a very positive kind of close group of students by the end of uh, 
the projects. They've, yeah. they've, and also they, they tend to share these dialogues with the other groups after they've finished. You know, they perform them or they get other students to perform them on their behalf. Um, and so a lot of information about students is being shared around the class. You know, and of course they've chosen what they've revealed about themselves. So, you know, it's, uh, there's uh, some consent there <laughs> in terms of what they share. So finally, uh, maybe we can get to this in the, in the question and answer part, because we're out of time. But basically, we want you to maybe think about what are some future uses of geodography? Um, how can they be used in the future? For example, like using triangulation and member checking like we were trying to do. What other topics could geodography approach? There are other kind of philosophies it can use to you know, uh, do what it wants to do. But maybe we can talk about this in the beginning. Yes. Thank you.